In 35 minutes, song structure and arrangement are today's subjects at the Rock School. Before that, here's John Nicholson to introduce this week's guest, who's open to question. Our guest tonight has taken horror a step beyond the Frankenstein monster and the psycho killer to produce storylines that some say can only be the result of a diseased mind. The man who's made millions terrifying people with visions from beyond the grave, Clive Barker, is open to question. of 34, Clive Barker is a phenomenon, an award-winning short story writer, an acclaimed novelist, illustrator, playwright, scriptwriter. There has always been plenty of hype surrounding the Clive Barker horror industry. The man who won British and World Fantasy Awards for his books of blood has recently turned his attention to making macabre movies. And now in film, just as in print, he displays an imagination which can get inside the skin of even the most unsqueamish person to produce bottomless depths of horror. We have such sights to show you. Clive Barker, does the fertility of your own imagination never disturb you? I mean, for most ordinary people, it must be pretty frightening to have that sort of thing in your mind just bursting to get out. It belongs to me. I mean, it's mine. For better or worse, it's mine. Um, and these kind of weird things have been going around my head since, well, for as long as I can remember. My mother will, will testify that when other kids were drawing houses with nuclear families standing outside and little suns in the sky, I was drawing beasts devouring other beasts. I think that's what I was always doing. So it's intimate to me. It's, uh, it's my kind of truth. And uh, I'm unashamed of it. Uh, and. I guess they're my monsters, you know, they belong to me. Sally Ross. Do you agree that video nasties have led to an increase in brutal assaults by teenagers on the elderly and children? Video nasties, can we, can we define our terms by what we mean by video nasties? Do we mean the 40 uh, um, movies that are on the sort of police, you know, list of the things which we can't release in this country? Or do we mean more broadly things like Nightmare on Elm Street and, and you know, any any sort of hardcore horror movie. The hardcore horror mo just, movies. Just like across, the, across the board. Like Hellraiser. Uh, like Hellraiser. Days. No, I don't think anybody is going to go out from, from Hellraiser and do anything that's in the picture. Um, I think that uh, what happens is that the, the kind of movies which tend to get uh, copied, uh, the behavior patterns of them get copied, tend to be more like uh, Rambo. I think, you know, uh, when, when you're looking at uh, what uh, Michael Ryan was inspired by, and I use the word uh, ironically, um, it's Rambo, it's not, it's not Freddy Krueger. I don't, I don't really have a, a real problem with that. Having said that, can I just go on? Having said that, address another part of the question. I do have a problem with videos, video nasties in the house and, having, and children having access to them. I don't know what you do about that, but it's a problem that has to be addressed. Um, I don't think it's particularly useful that six-year-olds should have access to Cannibal Ferox or one of the Italian zombie movies. Movies which I think it's fine for adults to see, but I don't think it's great to get into the heads of children. Yes. Uh, well, just um, wondering, having heard you speak um, about that, do you not think that a film like Rambo, you say that, say, Michael Ryan goes out and copies this, the things that you portray in your books and mm -hmm. in your film are far more horrific than the things that happen in Rambo. Do you not think in the subconscious mind people are going to latch onto this and I, try I, and follow out, I mean, not obviously the same way, but they're going to latch onto it and try and follow them through? Well, what, what could you latch onto in Hellraiser? I don't have a body in the attic that I can raise from the dead. I don't believe you can raise bodies from the dead. I don't believe in ghosts. I don't believe in demons. These are metaphors for something else. Yes, but you could commit a murder because there are numerous murders in Hellraiser. So oh, that's yeah. presumably the, yeah, I mean, the you, crux of the question. I agree, but even, even the motive for that, it seems to me, is related to demoniacal stuff and supernatural stuff. I do accept, again, I do accept there is an anxiety here, however. 
if you are talking about a movie which is solely based upon Psychos on the Loose, for instance, um, the Jason movies, the Friday the 13th pictures, in which you take vulnerable teenagers and you just kill them one by one with machetes or whatever else, I think that's uh, unhealthy. I try, with one exception in all my fiction, uh, a story called Dread, the, uh, the stories are based in something supernatural or fantastical. I don't write psycho on the loose stories. I don't write rapist on the loose stories. Um, and I have a problem with fiction, particularly um, the Nightmare on Elm Street pictures, I must say, that make kind of heroes or culture heroes of the, the man in the mask, the man with the machete. Um, those pictures actually get cheers for the murderers. I don't think, and I've seen Hellraiser now dozens of times with various audiences, I don't think I've ever heard anybody applaud or feel that the murders were in any sense entertaining in the same way as I think Freddy Krueger is meant to be. Yes, do you want to come in the second yeah. row? Yes. In the wake of the uh, instance like the hunger for killings, mm -hmm. do you think it's right to still use explicit violence in your writings? Or even in on my, screen? In my writings? Yeah, or, or in the films? I, it's what I do, <coughs> is one answer. I write horror fiction. Um, I write horror fiction which tries not to glamorize uh, the horror but present it. Uh, present it as truthfully as I know how. Um, the rightness and the wrongness of it is a tough one. I know that Stanley Kubrick, for instance, withdrew the movie of uh, Clockwork Orange from circulation in this country because there had been a couple of sort of copycat uh, attacks upon tramps which were, uh, I think, uh, copied from early sequences in the picture. Again, I go back to whether you can actually um, you can emulate this kind of material. I've tried wherever possible to make the, uh, the storylines um, clear metaphor for something uh, rather than them simply being um, uh, glamorized versions of, of murder scenes. That, yeah. I think, is reprehensible. Yes, do you want to come in? If, if what you're writing and what you're trying to do in your movies is essentially a metaphor, mm -hmm. a, and if you're just trying to write about something else and using the guise of horrors, why take the chance of, of this copycat thing we're talking about, why not just write exactly, why use metaphors, why not write to the crux of the problem? Well, I think that metaphor is a way of writing more strongly to the crux of the problem, uh, more touching more deeply the psychic things which are going on, <coughs> excuse me, than uh, producing a piece of realistic fiction. I believe in what I would loosely term as the fantastique. Mm -hmm. I believe in imaginative fiction as a way to directly address um, our fears, our anxieties, our aspirations. Um, it's the way my mind deals with my anxieties, the way my mind deals with my hopes for heaven. Um, I don't think there is a clearer way to the subconscious except via the imaginative. And um, I think, therefore, horror fiction can speak of death and anxiety and eroticism in a way that maybe um, uh, a, a more naturalistic or realistic fiction can't. Yes. Um, you said that Hellraiser was clearly metaphoric. Then why was it banned in Canada? I don't understand the question. Um, you said <laughs> that it didn't contain anything which could cause copycat violence. Right. Then why was it banned in Canada? It's very interesting to see. Have you seen the movie? No. Okay. That's why I was asking. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, it's interesting to see what the Canadians took out of the movie. It's now, it, they've now taken 40 seconds from the film. And they haven't taken out any of the murder sequences. They haven't taken out anything which faintly could be copied. They've taken out um, some very strange scenes with mechanical rats, <coughs> which I don't really understand. I mean, there's no logic involved here. I think that the problem I have with censors is that very often that they will censor the bizarrest things. 20 seconds were taken out of uh, Hellraiser for the American release. And <clears throat> several of those seconds involved scenes which were basically supernatural scenes, things which you simply couldn't go out and copy. Um, I can understand the argument that uh, a hammer murder, for instance, should be chopped down for you know scenes or moments removed from it because it's going to be too distressing or too realistic. I can. I think that's a legitimate point of view. It's not one that I necessarily agree with, but I can see the point of view. 
removing a couple of bizarre scenes with mechanical rats um, doesn't really compute for me. I think what happened with the Canadians is that they have um, a sense of, um, and this is going to raise this is going to raise a whole interesting issue. I think what they call the dignity of the human body, and they have a whole uh, point of view about the fact that the human body should not, in any sense, be changed or rearranged uh, in movies. Now, most of my favorite scenes from horror movies are about changing and rearranging the human body. People turning into bats, wolves, um, ghosts, whatever else. And one of the fascinating things for me is that one of the greatest horror, movies, horror movie makers in the world, David Cronenberg, who made Scanners and The Fly most recently, a wonderful uh, uh, movie maker, um, is a Canadian and one of, the, one of the greatest Canadian filmmakers. His movies are practically banned in his own country. I think it's regrettable. Yes, do you want to come in second back row? You stated that you have gone to autopsy, autopsies yeah. as yeah. a form of entertainment mm -hmm. and therefore it would seem to me that you share the same macabre taste as Myra Henley and Brady who enjoyed the thrill of dismembering the, victim, the bodies of their victims. Well, I'm, I'm assuming two things. Firstly, that uh, there is a kind of curiosity that we have as human beings about our life processes. And in one, one of our last life processes is death. It's, some, it's a legitimate um, subject for inquiry. It's a legitimate subject for curiosity. We shouldn't be ashamed that the macabre or the morbid exercises some fascination upon us. What we should be very wary of, and I'm picking up what I believe is the subtext of your question, is if, you're, if you ever hurt anybody, if you ever damage anybody psychically, with, or psychologically, with, with, with that curiosity. Now, I am friends with several pathologists. Pathologists have a very interesting profession. They are looking at a dead person and trying to find out why the dead person got that way. It's, um, it's, a, sort of, uh, it's a sort of retrospective Sherlock Holmes. You, you know, this person is there on the slab and you don't know why. That's a kind of, in, it's an interesting procedure. It's an interesting scientific procedure. It's an interesting um, detective procedure. And maybe for me, most excitingly, it's a confrontation with the thing that I am most scared of in all the world. That is my death. We are all scared of that. It's, it's, it's something that's at the back of our heads all the time. And to confront it and to, to, to see whether you can face that fear, I think is very important. No, for, me, it was a very, for me, it was a very healing experience. Um, I lightly said I went to enter for entertainment to, uh, to autopsies. I didn't take a radio and sandwiches. Um, I went um, anxious uh, with my heart thumping, wondering whether I was going to be able to deal with that experience. And I was, I was moved to tears by the experience because it was a confrontation by extension with my own mortality. Yes. Yeah, you, uh, it's been said that you like to pile horror upon horror, mm -hmm. and obviously watching horror makes desensitize you to it. Let's, let's to take, what point let's, are you going to go? Let's stop that for a moment. Why, obviously? Well, I mean, I know myself that I can watch things now that, like a year back, I couldn't have watched would have turned my stomach, and I've had to have walked out. And, and I think that goes. And do you think that bigger. that desensitizing is unhealthy for you? Yeah, I think so. Cause I think Why I'll do you then go back to the later experiences in order to find that you've been desensitized? Well, it's the thing you remember. I mean. You watch a film, and afterwards, sometimes you wish you hadn't watched it because it gives you nightmares and you don't enjoy it. But I suppose that's human nature. You're curious, right. but I don't, that doesn't necessarily mean it's good for you. Do you go back to horror movies? I mean, do you, do you watch horror movies? Not often, no. Only if they're on, sort of thing. Oh, on the television? Yeah. OK. I, I'd have to say that I don't think there's anything on the television in the way of horror movies which I would consider to be a, put us in serious danger of uh, desensitization. Um, then it might very well be in the A-team, but that's a different argument. Um, I certainly don't think that any horror movie that's going to get on television is going to do your psyche any harm whatsoever. Uh, I think that actually getting that kind of s that subtext of, of, of your anxieties and your fears out into your conscious is actually extremely healthy. But do you still think that you should go to any points necessary? Would to, I go to any yeah, points? Yeah, to give somebody a thrill. 
To give somebody a th yeah. simply a thrill, no. Uh, to, si to give somebody, a ch there's lots of things you can do in movies and in books which simply provide thrills. Um, I, horror fiction doesn't uh, attract me as a genre because it's simply a, a format for cheap thrills. Uh, it attracts me because I feel that I can write about quite serious subjects, in fact, some of the most serious subjects, um, uh, and address them in a, in, a, in a fashion which can be picked up in an airport or a railway station or whatever. In other words, at root, I'm a populist. I want my books and my movies to be out there to the largest number of people. And horror fiction and fantasy fiction, like the new book Weave World, allows me access to that kind yes, of front, audience. Front, front row with the green shirt. Do you have any points which you think to go beyond would be bad taste? Yes, lots. Uh, what, what such as? They, I would never, for instance, uh, write a piece of, of fiction which was an entertainment uh, about the concentration camp. I would never write a piece of entertainment fiction which was based on something that had actually happened. I again, go back to something I was saying much earlier about the fact that all my fiction is essentially fantastical fiction. Um, I am assuming from word one that werewolves, ghosts, and demons from other worlds don't exist. I am saying to the audience, look, this is, this is my equivalent of, uh, this is a dark version of Midsummer Night's Dream. The, 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 the story here is, um, you don't believe in fairies any more than I do, but the story makes a kind of psychic sense to us. But bodies under the floorboards <coughs> and brutal killings do happen, so you still write about those nonetheless. Yeah, bodies don't get resurrected from under floorboards, at least not in my neck of the woods. I don't know, maybe I'm living in the wrong place. <coughs> Front row. What do you see as the role of the horror writer? Do you see it as an entertainer, or do you see it as something else to make people confront their own fears? I think it's both. I have a responsibility to my readership uh, to give them a good time. If somebody comes along and spends 250 on the damnation game or buys Weave World or whatever, um, I can't say to, to that reader, look, um, you owe me the time to read this book. The, the thing which is going to make people read through the story and get to the stuff, the heart of the story, which is the, the kind of material that I really want the book to address is the storytelling, is the characterization, is the black humor, whatever. In other words, what I'm trying to do is produce a, um, a story form which is entertaining and eventually allows the reader to reach some kind of conclusion about the world. Uh, the analogy I use is, is a river. Fast rivers carry bigger stones. Think of the stones as being the meaning of the story. And the faster the river, the faster the story, the, the heavier the stone. The back, the back row, yes. Do you feel that um, things like blood, sex, gore, and violence are an essential ingredient for horrors? And if so, why? There was, at the turn of the century, and there has been into the 20th century, a different strand of horror fiction entirely, a strand I admire hugely. Uh, it's a strand I don't write very well. <laughs> there are certainly... Um, stories in my collections, The Books of Blood, uh, there are certainly stories coming up which I've got in mind which are, in which no blood is let at all. Weave World is 700 pages of fantasy in which there is rem remarkably little violence, there's a few monsters, um, but uh, there's none of the visceral stuff which, uh, which has made the, the Books of Blood uh, Famous and notorious, or both. Of course, a lot of people say that your, your books have really moved on to a whole new area of horror, and we'd like to hear your views okay. about horror through the ages, if you yeah. like. Horror uh, jo through the ages. Jo Joanna Morgan. Um, do you feel that people's um, fears have changed through the ages? Essentially not. I think that it was... I, I was talking recently with somebody, we were talking about the nuclear holocaust and how that was a uniquely 20th century idea uh, that we are, we are born with the idea now that, uh, uh, that the world can be obliterated like that. Um, I was born into that world, so were you. Um, in fact, there have been dreams and nightmares of the apocalypse, often religious based, re re it's got somebody else's teeth in, religiously based uh, 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 nightmares through the ages, and the, the have, that's always been there. What we have got, I think, is a situation in which the healing um, elements, the theologies which, 
would have maybe made the evil whole again, have disappeared. A um, hundred years ago, sitting here in this studio, the bulk of us would have believed in God. It would be interesting to know how many of us now do. Um, in other words, the force for good is evaporating. Peter, do you want to come in? Do you ever feel that you should have been living in another time when your creations would have been believed in by the public? No, I would hate that. Uh, it's, I, it's very important to me that they're not... When you say believed in, you mean that somebody finishes the book and says, my God, that's going to happen to me. There's a demon out there. Yes. Yeah. No, absolutely not. No, I'm, I am assuming that I am writing for a sophisticated readership that doesn't believe any of this stuff, and that's very important to me. Yes. What other writers have influenced you? Uh, it's such a long list. Uh, Ray Bradbury, Stephen King, Ramsey Campbell, uh, amongst horror writers, but also my favorite novel is Moby Dick, um, which is uncharacteristic, the I know. The brutal killing of a whale. The brutal yeah. of, br of a white whale. Yeah. Yes, would you like to come in? Second back row with a rugby shirt. Um, Mr. Barker, do you believe um, in a Jekyll and Hyde syndrome inherent in man? Do you believe that, they're, um, that everyone plays host to a beast within? Everyone? I, I know I do. I can speak for myself. <laughs> I'll only speak for myself. I think we've all got the potential for, for evil, I suppose, yes. I believe that evil is utterly human. And it doesn't come from anywhere but inside ourselves. So I suppose the answer would have to be yes. But you've got the outlet of writing about it. What do all the people do who've got this evil within them and who can't write books do? They read it. <laughs> yes. Given the graphic content of the stories, how would you feel about young children reading them? Bad. Um, one of the reasons why I write with a complex vocabulary and one of the reasons why I write stories which are not, as I say, Night of the Killer Slugs simple is to make sure that anybody who is going to have um, uh, just simply read these for a cheap thrill is going to have a tough time. I mean, I, I want to write dark, dangerous material. I want to write subversive material. But I don't want to write the kind of material which is going to uh, get into the minds, going back to the six-year-old again, who doesn't know how to context it. Um, <clears throat> whereas I know that Steve King has at his signings massive numbers of 10 to 14-year-olds. They never appear at my signings. The readership for my books just doesn't seem to be there at that age. Yes, Matthew. You were talking a couple of minutes ago about writers that you admired, mm -hmm. and something occurred to me that possibly the greatest horror writer, the most celebrated, Edgar Allan Poe, he had se several of the things that you've been talking about, a, a curiosity about death and almost obsession with it. And he oh, ended I, up I, I'm a, very much an obsession with it. And yeah. he ended up a raving lunatic and, yeah. and seemed to have been quite a stable man. Do, do you worry about... No, he wasn't, like, he wasn't a stable man. He did want to marry his cousin. I, you know, we should, <laughs> we should look at old Ed here, you know? I mean, Ed was not a terribly stable man. He also had a disease which, which meant that he, he took the merest sip of alcohol and he was dead drunk. I mean, he was, uh, and I, he died falling downstairs in a drunken stupor. Um, I don't think we're talking about Mr. Average here. Um, I don't think we're, to we're I'm talking to Mr. Average here, to be you honest, Mr. Think, well, I, wouldn't li I wouldn't like to be thought of quite as Mr. Average, but I would like to think that the kind of fiction that I am uh, presenting is reflecting, and does seem to be reflecting, otherwise I don't see why the books are selling, a genuine curiosity and a genuine interest in the subject matter. Well, I know Mel Melanie Horn was going to ask a question about just how average you are. <laughs> <laughs> how average am I? You would met an enjoyment of confrontation with your nightmares. Don't you think this shows a slightly warped mind, since the whole idea of nightmares is that they terrify you? No, the whole idea of nightmares, as far as the psyche is concerned, is to deal with in sleep what we can't deal with in our day-to-day lives. Now, it seems to me that an, a nightmare, in other words, is evidence of a confused and frightened psyche. But the background to this question, I think, to oh, explain okay. for people watching, is that you say that you used to be disappointed when you woke up from your nightmares and you used to actually quite enjoy them, oh, yeah, which the, is I, a very unusual behaviour. I get behavior. a story from them. Uh, you see, this, but this is, comes back to being at peace with your imagination and it being in peace, at peace with the beasts. I mean, I create this stuff. It's my, it belongs to me. I'm very, uh, they're my children. Yes, do you want to come in? You said that your nightmares is a way of dealing with stuff that you mm. can't deal with sort of consciously uh -huh. through the day. Are you not then taking your nightmares and putting them on the screen and then saying deal with them? 
Well, I'm assuming that the, the, the things which scare me are universals, and I'm assuming that the subject matter of nightmares is more or less common. And reading Jung, for instance, or reading Freud, it seem, that seems to be true. Uh, Jung talks about the collective unconscious and the images in the collective unconscious, and both in terms of our hopes for heaven and our fears for hell, that those images are common. In, in, um, in Weave World, I've addressed, for instance, the notion of Eden. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a book about Eden, in some senses. It's a book about the dreamed place from which we have all been exiled. We don't quite know why we've been exiled. When I started to research it, I found that every culture on Earth has an Eden myth of some kind or other. Every culture on Earth, Hindu, Islamic, whatever else, whatever the religious bias, whatever the, 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 the cultural uh, context, has a hell, has a heaven. Um, and the images from a Chinese hell, for instance, uh, of 2,000 years ago are remarkably similar to a 15th century hell in Rome. Um, images of fear and anxiety and images of goodness and light are, I believe, held in common. And so when I'm writing about my nightmares, I am assuming, and again, it seems to me that the, the letters I get and the, the comments I get at signing seems to bear this out, those, those images are going to be in common with my readership. Yes. What type of person would you say you are? You go to autopsies, you see people getting cut up, and you get cheap thrills out of it. What type of person would you describe yourself as? I hoped I defended myself against the cheap thrills description. I don't think it was a cheap thrill at all. Um, but yes, I've gone to autopsy. I do a lot of other things, you know. I go to restaurants. I mean, it's not, it's not like it's like a, a daily activity for me. Um, I think of myself as being remarkably normal and remarkably well balanced. Uh, my analyst disagrees. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'd like to know how you justify some of the explicitly gory f scenes in Hellraiser. And is that the kind of thing that comes out of your imagination? If so, do you put them in just to give people thrills or do you I just to give people nightmares? thrills? I certainly hope there are thrills in that. I enjoy that kind of material. I mean, I have yes, to... But I have do you to enjoy coming out of a film feeling like unfulfilled, thinking, God, I felt sick during that film? Ah, uh, yes. You enjoy that? Yes. I mean, what can I tell you? I mean, I was talking about Cronenberg uh, earlier on. Cronenberg is, for me, one of the great filmmakers. When, when uh, Jeff Goldblum's <laughs> ear falls off in the fly, it's one of my favorite moments of cinema, you know? I, I mean, what that says about me, Would I don't know. Would you like know. to see that in real life? Would you like to see a road accident and be thrilled no, by it? Of course not. And that's the whole point, isn't it? That's exactly the point. The point but is that you can, that, that the vicarious experience is the important one. The important one is that you can actually deal with these things on, on a filmic level, on a cinematic level, or a literary level. Do you I think it's to, important to be able to well, do this. Do you want to come back so one, one more time? If I can see, I, go, I went and saw the film, so if I come back and Next day I see a road accident, I'm going to be all, all right, I'm going to be able to deal with it. Is that one with is the gore? One is fantasy, one is fiction. And, and one is fantasy, one is reality, I'm sorry. And, and I think that's an important distinction. Uh, one, is, one is real pain, one is a drama. Um, if you, when you go to Macbeth or when you go to King Lear and you see the eye gouging sequence, what do you think? You think, you know, well, I hope I never have to see an eye gouging. Of course you do. And that's perfectly legitimate. What it seems to me to, important to say is that death and violent death are part of our experience. Um, you do see road accidents. I saw one yesterday just round the corner from my house. I never want to stage a road accident in a movie. That's not interesting to me. But to write about or to, to make movies which are about metaphors, which are about forbidden material, which is about eroticism, which is about demons, yes, that is interesting to me. Yes, do you want to come in? Do you not think that the excessive use of gore and violence is just the easy way for a horror writer to be successful anyway? I think that that accusation um, or comment has certainly been thrown at me. I hope to justify what I do. Um, there are probably moments in uh, my fiction, uh, which if analyzed, I would say, well, maybe I could have down that a little bit. But I tell it like it is. If it's there in my mind's eye, I put it on the page. And that seems to me to be a legitimate way to write. Yes. I'd like to know um, which position you class yourself in, say, the top 10 horror writers, because it seems to me you class yourself way at the top. I don't class myself at all. 
I have been in this business three and a half years, and I don't, there's no hierarchy as far as I'm concerned. Steve King said some very nice things about me. Ramsey said some very nice things about me. Finally, there's no race for any finishing line. The people who like me like me. The people who despise me despise me. There's no competition. I don't like the idea that somehow or other there's number one and then there's number two or whatever. My fiction appeals to a certain number of people. To a, a lot of other people, it doesn't appeal. That's cool. I think many of these people want to know exactly how much you believe of all this. Of uh, uh, the hype. Shahi Sikta. Do you believe in the supernatural? And if you do, has anything strange ever happened to you? I wish something strange had happened to me. No, nothing strange, nothing even faintly weird has ever happened to me. No ghosts, no UFOs, no, nothing so like that. What is your greatest fear? Flying, probably. I mean, something as simple as that. Unnatural act, I mean, you know, shouldn't be up in those things. Um, um, I don't like elevators much. I'm claustrophobic. I mean, they're, they're very simple things like what is, that. Haven't you got one fear, that one thing that gets you badly? Yeah, I mean, actually, it's, it's flying. I mean, I've, just, I've been doing promotional tours for the books and the movie now across America for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. I've spent five days by the time I added it all up on a plane, five neurotic days clutching the thing, saying, go on, go on, fly, fly. <laughs> I, it's not my idea of a good time. Stephen Sergeant, why is horror fiction the literary form which describes the world most truthfully? What is wrong with love, truth, and beauty? Well, love, truth, and beauty come into the new book. A lot of love, a lot of truth, a lot of beauty. Um, for me, uh, let me tell a story which may uh, help with this. Um, a, uh, a guy came in, a 15-year-old came into a bookstore in uh, America uh, with his mum, and he had brought the Clive Barker collection, the kind of thing, in paperback. And he bought a copy of The Damnation Game. And an interviewer was there and said, why do you read this guy? Why have you got a t-shirt on which is written, there is no delight, the equal of dread, which is a line from one of the books, and Clive Barker's name and a bullet hole in the back of his t-shirt. Uh, don't ask, I don't know. So, and the guy, the, the guy said, I am of the generation of fear, he said. I am afraid of being uh, blown up. I am afraid of AIDS. I am afraid of the streets. This is in New York, so we had reason for that. Um, and it seemed to him that horror fiction best helped to explain to him the world he lived in. Now, it's not the only explanation. And one of the reasons why I've gone on to Weave World was to write a different kind of book, a more optimistic book, a book in which there was triumph, uh, there was a triumph of good, there was a triumph of light. Clive Barker, the recurring fear of many members of the audience here seems to be that however clear the distinction is in your mind between fiction and fact, that that distinction may not be very clear in the minds of many readers. Right. Is there anything that could ever convince you that uh, the sort of things that you write really do disturb people in a dangerous way? Could you ever be convinced of that? And if so, what would you do? Could I ever be convinced of that? This, this is so theoretical. Um, I go back to something I was saying earlier about the fact that most of the stuff which goes on, on in my books would require some supernatural happenstance or, or other to occur in order for there to be an echo of something in the material. If somebody said, after reading one of your books, I feel like bludgeoning someone to death, what would you do? I'd say, did you feel the same after reading Winnie the Pooh? Because it's every bit as lightly. <laughs> I don't think for a moment that uh, the bludgeoning response is more likely to come from a piece of my fiction than it is from Winnie the Pooh. Clive Barker, thank you very much for being open to question. Thank you.